Good morning, everyone. Welcome back to the Sustainable AI Conference. I'm here at the University of Bonn, uh, specifically at the Institute for Science and Ethics. You see my hair blowing in the wind. I have many fans in front of me. It is very, very hot here. So if it's hot where you are, I thank you so much for coming here and being with us today. I know it's difficult to concentrate in weather like this. My name is Amy van Weinsberg. I am the Alexander von Humboldt Professor for Applied Ethics of Artificial Intelligence. And I'm really excited for this third and final day of the conference. It's been an incredible two days. So many lessons learned. We've identified gaps. We've, we've, I think we've successfully emphasized the need for, for having this discussion on a, on a global scale. Two things that I want to do before we jump into the fifth paper session. The first thing is to send out a reminder about a call for the special issue. So we are working together with the International Journal of Sustainability. We have a special issue called Towards the Sustainability of AI, Multidisciplinary Approaches to Investigate the Hidden Costs of AI. The deadline is September 1st. Please feel free, anyone who has uh, participated in the conference or who has joined us uh, via the live stream and is thinking about ideas that they would like to publish, please feel free to submit. We want a variety of different perspectives, different disciplines, so thank you. The second thing that I would like to do is to give a shout out to some of the people who are be behind the scenes helping me uh, in preparing for the conference, but also uh, on the day-to-day -day getting water, uh, answering emails, and so on and so forth. Nasheed, I have Paulina, and I have Larissa Bolte. These three ladies are helping with everything from answering all of your emails to, uh, yeah, organizing topics and themes. So say hi. Yeah. I just wanted to say a big thank you for everything that they've done. I'm new here to the university, and so I know that I have uh, put them to the test and asked them to do things that they've never done before, and they have just surpassed all of my expectations. So thank you very much to the three of you. All right, now shall we start the paper sessions? Uh, we are going to begin, so this paper session is really looking at uh, how to evaluate AI for sustainability and the sustainability of AI. So we're really going to bring now these two uh, dimensions together, the of and the for. Uh, looking at what it means to do a kind of evaluation, so opportunities, considerations, and how do we even uh, have such a conversation with policy, with policy makers. So I'm really excited to bring you our first speaker, uh, Lynn Kack, who is also going to be joined by uh, Rafaela Koch. Um, they are going to kick off our morning session and get into the discussions. Uh, Lynn, it's really nice to have you here. Nice to see you again. Haven't seen you uh, in a while, in about a month, but thank you for being here and I'm really looking forward to your talk. So please, the, the floor is yours. Oh, just one quick reminder. There's 30 minutes for this session. You have 20 minutes for your uh, part, for your talk. And then at the 10 minute mark, we will do question and answer. Everyone who's joining in the Zoom call, the speakers and panelists, please feel free to ask questions in the chat function. Anyone who is joining us on the live stream, please feel free to ask questions in the box just underneath the video. Thank you. Please, Lynn, take it away. Thanks. Hi. Yeah, I'm Lynn Karg. I'm a postdoc at ETH Zurich, an incoming professor at Hertie School, and I'm also co-founder and chair of Climate Change AI. And um, pass over to Rafaela. Hi, thank you. <laughs> I'm Rafaela Koch. I'm a PhD student at the University of Zurich and Zurich University of Applied Sciences. And um, yeah, so thank you for joining us today. I try if this works. So um, Lynn and I are going to talk about the uh, opportunities, considerations, and policy levers to align AI with climate change goals today. So let me try. I hope this, this slide moves now. No, it doesn't. <laughs> I can't really move on with the slides, sorry. <laughs> then does it work for you? It did not, but now it does. So I can just pass on. The slides, you can just tell me when. Okay, so I think that was you. So climate change, yeah. So what do we know 
uh, about climate change. Climate change is one, maybe even the most pressing issue of our time. And the figure here that you can see is taken from the 1.5 um, degree special report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. And it shows the observed global mean temperature since 1960. So due to human activity, as you can see, we already reached about one degree of global warming today. And it's very likely, or let's say likely to reach 1.5 degree between 2030 and 2050, if we keep going like this, and if the increase will um, stay at the current rate. And the negative impacts of global warming for humans and nature can already be felt today, even here in Europe. If we reach 1.5 or even two degree of global warming, the climate related risk uh, will, be much, will be much higher. So I try again if I, no, can you? <laughs> for me, it also doesn't work the clicker right now. Now it does, okay. Okay, thanks. So the, um, to stop this trend and mitigate global warming, we need to reduce global CO2 emissions. And the gray, the shaded area here shows the likely range of warming responses depending on a hypothetical emission pathway in the future, which is depicted on the smaller figure on the right-hand side. So the gray area shows the likely range of the estimated distribution of warming if net zero is only reached in 2050, uh, 55. And in blue, if we reach net zero in 2040. Thus, as you can see, the speed of reduction will have a really large effect on the warming. And it would also depend. Um, next slide. It would also depend on, um, on other types of greenhouse gas emissions. As you can see, the purple area is much larger and the warming will be much higher if we consider also other greenhouse gas emissions. So next slide, please. Um, Sorry, I need to click several times before something moves. It worked, thanks. <laughs> um, so as we know, artificial intelligence is an important technology and it's increasingly used. So the question is really, how can we align AI and climate change strategies um, and climate change goals? So there's three um, important aspects at the intersection of um, artificial intelligence and climate change that we would like to highlight here. So the first one, um, if can you? I'm, I'm, I'm clicking <laughs> sometimes before something else. So the first one we would like to show you are examples of AI applications and mitigation adaptation. So mitigation refers to reducing greenhouse gas emissions and adaptation refers to adapting to a changing climate and its effects. And the next, um, the next um, aspect we would like to highlight are AI applications that increase emissions. And then thirdly, uh, um, the, uh, we would like to show the uh, look at the aspect of energy use of AI itself. So let's get started with the AI applications and mitigation and adaptation. So Lynn and other colleagues of mine at Climate Change AI have written a paper in which they describe um, how machine learning can be a powerful tool in, in reducing greenhouse gas emissions but also helping society adapt to changing climate. And I identify a couple of reoccurring themes uh, that we would like to show now. <laughs> Oops, that's too fast. So the first reoccurring theme is uh, gathering information. As large amounts of unstructured data become available, such as satellite imagery or large corpuses of texts, um, or text documents I can help to gather decision relevant insights from this data. So for instance, by tracking greenhouse gas emissions in real time or pinpointing deforestation as it happens, but also gathering inf infrastructure data, such as uh, locations of buildings from satellite imagery. And I would like to dive into one example here of text to data analysis, where AI can be used to gather and classify information on coordinate climate action. So what is the motivation here? Understanding alignment of actions by non-state actors and national governments is really critical given the need that we need coordinated actions and to achieve ambitious climate goals. So for example, AI can be used here to analyze climate strategy documents of countries and regions and applying natural language, language processing techniques, including 
top modeling, which is an unsupervised machine learning method, allows, for example, to discover topics in a text corpus. As you can see here, this was done in uh, studies already. Uh, so another overarching theme is um, forecasting. Um, so this is uh, this refers to applications areas such as predicting renewable energy supply to help power system optimization, but also predicting transportation demand uh, for public transit planning or predicting extreme weather events, which is important to um, inform disaster response um, efforts. The third theme I would like to highlight, uh, this one fast. Yeah, so the third theme is improving operational efficiency. So this theme occurs in many different contexts, including, for example, the optimization of heating and cooling in buildings, but also optimization of freight routes, um, freight transportation systems, or optimizing food ordering systems to avoid um, uh, waste, food waste. And the fourth theme is predictive maintenance. So this refers to um, understanding failures as or before they occur. And this can be really useful, for example, in preventing natural gas leaks in an industrial setting or building more um, climate resilient infrastructure. And I would like to dive into one example here in this area, which is um, the maintenance of rail system. Uh, rail systems. Mm -hmm. So rail systems are really critical to decarbonizing both passenger and freight transportation. And predictive maintenance can really help, help increase the competitiveness of these systems. So for instance, by making them more efficient and reducing the need for costly repairs. So if something fails, it's much more costly to repair it if you prevent it from failing in the first place. And AI, AI can be really useful here in analyzing large amounts of sensor data at scale in order to detect anomalies that could grow to failures in the future. So for example, as you can see here on the right-hand side, Deutsche Bahn is using automated technologies to analyze sensor data to understand failures of their railroad switches. And then the next theme is um, that AI can help accelerate the the process of scientific experimentation. Um, so for example, it can help developing new materials and can speed up this process, for example, from learning from past scientific experimentations. And this can be done, for example, for new electric fuel materials, but also for conducting solids for batteries, for example. And then the last theme, um, I like to highlight here is uh, that AI can be used to approximate time intensive simulations. Um, for example, physical processes like climate models, but also energy models, or um, like smaller models um, that are associated with city planning. This can be, for example, wind flows in cities. And in many, in many of these cases, um, it's really needed to have a very time intensive model that would take a lot, not only time, but also energy to run. And AI can help to speed up these models or uh, slim, the, slim down these models. And I would like to show you one example here of localized climate models. So here there's a need to downscale them to make predictions more localized. So we know what's really happening in a specific uh, place. And this can enable decision-making, for example, by city governments. And it's really important to adapt to a changing climate. But however, such localized predictions are often not possible because it's so, so com these models are so complex and time intensive. And that's where AI comes in and can help to um, approximate these um, these models and um, approximate part of these models make this whole process faster and uh, more um, yeah, accessible. Yeah, so now that I've out outlined, so outlined some of the ways that uh, AI can help with many um, climate strategies, we like to frame that with some context and caveats. So first, um, um, yeah, many important strategies for climate action, we need to keep in mind that they don't really benefit from AI at all. We don't really 
need them sometimes. So for example, smart buildings are good, but making sure buildings are well insulated may be an easier and even more impactful first step before we start applying AI. So even when AI is applicable, it's, it's, we need to keep in mind it's, it's only one part of the strategy. It's only one piece of the puzzle. So it's a tool that can accelerate and enable other work that is needed. And it's worth remembering that sometimes the flashy applications of AI that get a lot of attention, um, get a lot of press like self-driving cars might not be as impactful for the climate as more mundane applications like freight routing. And finally, we need to consider that AI is a technological tool. So it's, we can't say it's intrinsically either good or bad um, because it can be used for different applications and that applications that even harm the climate and we need to keep that in mind. So now um, we will hear more about these, um, these applications and with that I hand over to Lynn. Yeah, thank you. And sorry for the mess up with the slides. I had some issues with the responsiveness of the clicker, um, but I think I figured it out now. Um, so yeah, so let me talk about the AI applications that can potentially increase emissions. Um, so as you know, AI is a multi-purpose tool and that means it can also be used in ways that can ultimately result in increased greenhouse gas emissions. And um, Greenpeace has issued a widely recognized um, report titled Oil in the Cloud. And um, there they found that AI is really used throughout the value chain in the oil and gas sector. Um, and they found that um, those AI technologies have boosted production levels in some cases by as much as 5%. And they also cite the number from Accenture that um, found that it also generates quite some revenue for the oil and gas sector. So ultimately that could have negative impacts on decarbonization. Um, but the climate impacts here of AI itself are of course really hard to measure. Um, and then there are also those AI technologies that have an uncertain impact on the climate. So um, for example, autonomous vehicles um, can have, as we see in this figure, um, various effects on the energy consumption while driving. So um, there are numerous effects that can actually reduce the energy consumption, but then there are also those effects that are, again, might increase the, um, both the energy consumption in the vehicle, but also the overall energy consumption from transportation, most notably by reducing the barriers to individualized transport. And um, it's still unknown how this technology will affect greenhouse gas emissions on the long run. Um, then there are also other technologies, for example, the shared economy that um, leverages AI quite a bit, where we don't know what are the effects on emissions. Um, so what we're talking about here are both rebound effects, but also other systemic effects. And um, then there are also effects from, from technologies that might not relate to climate or energy at all in the first place. For example, um, AI for personalized advertising, where that can drive consumption increases overall. And um, again, here also, this is very hard to measure. And um, what we really need is uh, a climate focused um, technology assessment of AI to really be proactive about the effects on the long run. Um, and then I wanted to talk about the energy use of AI itself. Um, so AI is um, our computer models. So they need computational um, power for both inference, I mean, for all inference training and the development of models. And um, one thing to know here in the beginning is that AI models have very different sizes. So they're computer uh, models of, of very different requirements, computational requirements. So the smallest we can actually run and we can even train on laptops. Um, but then there are also these very large ones, for example, GPT-3 by OpenAI that have something like 175 billion parameters. And this is especially prominent in the natural language processing field. Um, and there has been a paper from Emma Strabell and colleagues and that looked at the CO2 emissions that come from um, from AI models. And in particular, what they looked at is some of the largest um, AI models that exist, so from natural language processing, and they examined um, experimentation with those models. Um, this is to develop the models, essentially, to build them. And um, what you can see here, those very high numbers, 
um, they correspond to this um, development phase, to the extensive experimentation. Luckily, in practice, those models are often not trained from scratch. And I wanted to dive a little bit deeper into this point, um, how just the different um, phases of developing machine learning models or AI models um, differ in terms of energy consumption and frequency. So in this figure from a working paper that I, um, I have written, among others also with Emma Strobel, we illustrate um, exactly how these different phases relate to one another. Um, so if you start on the right, you can see um, this is the development phase. It's a, um, the most energy intensive one. You need, you need several thousand training runs to, um, to, run, to search the, the right parameters, the right architecture to increase the performance of these models. Um, then training runs are in themselves more energy intensive than just using the model. So the inference stage. Um, and of course, the inference stage where you just pass through the model once is the least energy intensive. But then that, that's not all that matters. It also matters how often you do this step, right? So inference, for example, even though it's not very energy intensive um, for every individual run, um, at times it's done a billion times a day, depending on the application. So um, here we really have to understand how these actually, how this energy consumption sums up. Um, then training is done sometimes every day, sometimes every week, sometimes only in the beginning of, um, of when you develop the application. So um, here we also really need more information on, on what is actually the practices in the industry. And then de this development, this really energy intensive activity um, happens rather rarely, fortunately. Um, this is mostly constrained to research and development in industry. And it's also very expensive, so not, not every, um, institutional company actually can even afford this development, model development. Um, so what I just said is that frequency and the use patterns also matter. So what we would be interested in is how does the energy consumption of AI add up in the big picture? And um, unfortunately, we don't know that. What we know is that um, data centers cost about 1% of the worldwide electricity consumption. All of um, information and communication technologies um, are less uh, are around 1.4 percent, um, according to some estimates of the total greenhouse gas emissions globally. And um, a fraction of that is due to AI applications, but we unfortunately don't know which fraction. And um, what we what is interesting though is that the um, electricity demand of data centers has remained rather constant, so there have been large efficiency gains. There has been this study. Um, by Eric Massonet, um, where they found that within a, a time frame of eight years, the compute instances that you can see on the left have increased drastically, but the energy consumption has only marginally increased. And this is really due to the, um, to the large efficiency improvements in data centers. So if the efficiency trends continue, um, you can also assume that under double demand, actually you won't have much more electricity consumption. But we don't know if we actually will be able to, to um, have these large efficiency gains also in the future. Um, and of course, the greenhouse gas emissions don't only depend on the electricity consumed, but also on the carbon intensity of the electricity. So um, we might be going a bit over time. I hope that's OK. Um, I wanted to also briefly touch on ways that we can shape the the climate impact of AI. Um, so there are, of course, um, policy levels that are really important and also industry can do quite a bit to do that. And on a high level, um, of course, the general climate policies um, are also really important here. That means um, if we have carbon pricing, for example, this will help uh, to use AI to actually reduce greenhouse gas emissions as opposed to simply reducing costs. Um, and then there are, of course, specific approaches to align AI with climate change goals. And um, we have like three identified three high level um, approaches that are important here. So the first one is incentivizing applications that help address climate change, which we heard about in the beginning of this talk. Those are mostly R&D policies. Um, there are a lot of ideas how one can improve this area. Then the second one is requiring transparency and accountability in cases where AI could increase emissions. That is both the applications, through the applications and um, through the energy consumption of the compute. Um, and then the last one is incorporating a climate focus 
in technology assessment for AI and AI driven technologies. So really being aware of also the systemic changes that AI can introduce and how that affects decarbonization. Um, Rafaela and I are both part of a, a organization called Climate Change AI that um, really made its mission to catalyze impactful work at this intersection of climate change and AI. And um, we are a global network um, that provides also resources. We provide, provide advice to um, stakeholders, and we also um, organize a number of events in this area. So, for example, we've organized a series of workshops, so full day conference events um, at the largest AI conferences. We have one upcoming in July now at ICML. And um, we've been at the COP25, the climate conference. Um, we've um, engaged with a TED countdown on climate. Um, and we have um, regular webinars on this topic as well. And you, on our website, you can actually find a number of recordings and papers if you're interested in this space. Um, so please um, engage with us if you're interested in the space. We have a newsletter that comes out every month. And on the website, you can also find um, all the relevant resources. Thank you so much. Thank you, both of you. That was really great. That was really interesting. I have quite a few follow-up questions for you now. Um, and also, thanks for talking about climate change AI. I hope people had enough time to write down the link. Uh, maybe one of you could also write it in the, the Zoom chat window, just in case the, any of the speakers and panelists want to uh, make sure they have the right information. Um, so what, what I wanted to do before I get into the questions that are on, on the screen in front of me, I thought I would maybe make some links with the talk that you two gave us today and some of the previous conversations we've been having over the last couple of days. And so we've heard, you know, we had a panel that was co-organized by Algorithm Watch where we had someone from the uh, Federal Ministry of Environment here, uh, here in Germany. And, you know, we were talking about um, Algorithm Watch, Matthias Spielkamp was saying, we need a policy to actually, um, yeah, force companies to have to start recording things, you know, to have to start taking... Uh, yeah, giving us the numbers so that we have some information on the kind of uh, energy consumption that's happening. And then we had on the policy making side, what do we do, you know, how do we do this? So when you showed us that diagram about um, the, the different kinds of ways we should be thinking about energy consumption from inference, training and development, and you know, you nicely showed us how there are different things to take into consideration. How would you say this plays into policy? I mean, would you say that we need to have the recording of the frequency of, of training and whatnot at each of these different stages? Or, you know, can you say something more about what, what that particular diagram means uh, in terms of policy implications? Yeah, so for, um, you're speaking about the bottom-up perspective, essentially where we are interested in what are individual AI applications, how do they look, and what are the practices. And I think really at this point, um, anything would be interested, you know, of course, the model specifics that, that of the models that are most frequently used or most important for the operation and how often retraining happens, um, how large the data sets are that are used for training. Um, you know, there are lots of specific, I think at the highest level, it would already be enough to understand um, maybe the compute requirements that they have on average. I mean, that would be probably the least sensitive information, but it would already help to understand, you know, this sector is using AI and it's requiring this much energy. Um, so yeah, I think any specifics would be helpful. Um, I do realize that it's um, quite sensitive information. The more you um, speak about the model and the applications and the users, the more you also reveal about your business. So I assume that um, there's gonna be, needs to be some effort to make that um, less sensitive information. Um, one idea that I, I was, thinking about, and I don't know how feasible it is, but um, to use already existing reporting requirements that are proposed under the um, new AI, um, reg proposed AI regulation, um, which could maybe be a, a way to sort of leverage the reporting that already has to happen about a certain kind of models um, in mm -hmm. order to, to um, also get a better handle on the energy use patterns. 
And what would this, this bottom up information would really be helpful for informing best practices. So you could get more information about how often should we be retraining? Um, how do, do model specifics translate also from one setting to another, right? You could make more efficient models, but if nobody then uses them, um, there's also a little use. So like, how do people inform themselves about which, um, which application is most suitable also from an energy perspective? Um, what we also really need is data from the top-down perspective. So um, from the data center operators, for example, how much of their load is AI load and how is it changing? Is it increasing a lot? Um, that information is so far is not available to research at least, um, but the requiring that could also be helpful if, if policymakers would move on, on that front. Um, that would definitely give the big picture on where we are heading with AI and how big the, the share of AI energy consumption actually is. So I'm, I'm really happy you brought that up. I have a follow-up question then on that point, on requiring you know, the data centers to also contribute some numbers. And yesterday we had a conversation with Mark Kuckelberg, and he's just written a book, you know, addressing the, the topic of climate change and AI, and a core concept within this book is freedom. And one of the questions that was asked to him when, you know, we had a similar conversation where he said we should be requiring uh, data centers and, and large tech companies to provide us with these numbers. And one question that came in was, aren't you restricting the freedom of researchers or tech companies or people who want to make the technology. So I'm just curious, um, you know, what would you say if a question was thrown at you like that? Maybe I can start on this. Uh, I feel like um, there are many, uh, like uh, there's a huge uh, um, availability of different sets of tools that could be used on a policy level. Um, for example, if we have a price on carbon, then the energy use, this should be priced in. So um, doesn't necessarily need that the policy says um, or it dictates the way we apply AI um, very concrete, but it could uh, set incentives to reduce or think or take into account even the energy use of these AI models and complement this with other um, more targeted um, policy um, tools. So I think it doesn't necessarily um, yeah, restrict our freedom and how we can uh, apply and how we train. I think that's not the goal that policy um, tells us exactly what, <laughs> what we need to do, but um, it can create incentives to, um, to price this in the effects of climate change. And I think that would be the first necessary yeah. step here. Yeah, maybe. and maybe another aspect I mean, absolutely agree with that. And another aspect is that often, um, I mean, I hear a lot of suggestions to, for example, from again, from the bottom up perspective to require um, emissions disc disclosure from any AI projects. And often the only thing you can really measure at this point is the energy consumption and the downstream effects are, are much harder to measure. And I'm worried that if you are making requirements like these, especially on research, that then um, potentially impactful applications will be shut down because they use a lot of energy for training and, and at the research stage. Um, so one has to be a bit careful about such requirements um, and need to also figure out this impact assessment piece um, in the global picture, not only on the energy consumption side. That's maybe yeah. one other aspect here. So actually talking about the assessment piece that you just mentioned, one of the questions that I have from one of our uh, audience members is, you've been mentioning that there's a need for climate-focused technology assessment. Are there any helpful ones that are out there at the moment, or are we waiting for these groundbreaking assessments? So I think um, autonomous vehicles have quite some research in that direction. So maybe that's a good example. I mean, here it's pretty straightforward to think about energy consumption because it's transportation and lots of the AI um, applications there are actually helping to reduce energy consumption. So it's already in the picture. Um, I think it gets, yeah, it gets much harder for AI applications that do not relate to energy or emissions in a straightforward way. Um, and then it's always very hard to, to disentangle like the additional value of AI um, because it's often it's just one little component in a, in a big chain of tools and, and 
developments. Um, so you really have to understand, okay, what would have happened without AI here? And um, I think there we're still pretty much in the beginnings. So that actually, oof, that, that relates to the second question, but I, I do have to move on to the next speaker, but I'll at least ask the question and so you have it in case it's relevant for your paper. Um, accordingly, many climate strategies don't need AI uh, all the time. Can you tell us more about climate strategies that do need AI and what kind of AI is it that they need? So I, I don't have time to answer it, but in case that helps, you know, your, your thinking when you do the paper. But I do want to ask one more question for myself personally. I've been trying to ask as many of the speakers as I can the same question um, to kind of map the landscape here. Um, when we're talking about sustainable AI, it is very much uh, up and coming and a new sort of area of exploration. AI ethics has been around now for quite some time. Uh, philosophy of AI, you know, political philosophy are coming into the equation now. What would you say is the most pressing concern or challenge that sustainable AI should be taking, or should be thinking about? You can also jump in. Um, I think, yeah, we made it pretty clear that I think um, for us, climate change is, is a central element of the sustainability. Of course, um, all the others are important as well, but um, the climate crisis is very urgent at the moment. Um, so thinking about how we can leverage AI to help with that is um, on the forefront. Um, and being mindful of especially those systemic effects on, on the larger economy of AI. Yeah, I, I think I <laughs> can just agree, agree with Second. Yeah. Okay, one more. Um, yeah. yeah, so yeah. thank you. Thank you both of you for being with us this morning and for the thought provoking uh, paper presentation. I'm really looking forward to seeing this new paper that's coming out with, with uh, Lynn and Struble. That looks really great. So um, yeah, Thanks. please write me when it comes out or tweet it or something. <laughs> um, thank you, uh, nice yeah. to see you again, nice to meet you. Thank and, you. And uh, hope you join us for the rest of the day. So moving on to our second speaker of this session, we have Daniela Toulon. And we will, Daniela will be talking about trade-offs for designing effective SDG-driven AI applications. Daniela, are you there? Wonderful, the stage is yours, I hand it over to you. Thank you, and it's uh, really a pleasure to be uh, part of this uh, wonderful uh, conference. So in this talk, uh, I will uh, focus on the design phase of uh, the um, uh, AI from the business and the computer science perspective. So actually I work for a long time as a computer scientist in the area of algorithms, modeling, automatic real-time monitoring and anomaly detection in, in academia and research labs like MIT and Bell Labs. And, and then in the past 10, 10 years, I actually focus on the design of uh, applications to address sustainability issues. And recently I launched EcoSurge, which is an initiative that brings together um, IoT and AI technologies and new business model to uh, address uh, for, uh, for the SDGs through the active collaboration of uh, uh, academia, uh, SME, small and medium uh, enterprises and institution. So, uh, okay, yep. Um, so many of you have experienced uh, the, the potential of uh, AI in uh, uh, accelerating the sustainable development goal. I did, uh, and uh, actually in my work, uh, I, I saw the benefit of, uh, for instance, applying AI in the water sector, in uh, uh, detecting water leaks, uh, in uh, aging infrastructure, thus saving uh, water and energy, or uh, in the electrical 
mm -hmm. microgrids uh, in, in the dynamic demand response uh, management uh, or in the mitigation of uh, uh, extreme uh, climate event. So the PWC actually estimated uh, that uh, uh, by 2030, AI can lead uh, to a 4% uh, global reduction of the CO2 and also a global increase of the uh, GDP. But uh, actually, uh, we uh, we know very well uh, that uh, this is a uh, part of the story and also that uh, this wonderful tool has uh, to be sustainable so we discussed this uh, uh, during these uh, two um two days but uh, what is uh, really clear for us uh, that um, work uh, in the field uh, is not uh, so clear for uh, for people that uh, um, work in other in other communities and because of the um, actually success cases and the widespread enthusiasm for AI, sometimes AI is regarded as a more as a solution to our sustainability challenges and the climate changes, rather than an opportunity uh, to accelerate uh, um, the sustainability transition and actually an opportunity that doesn't need to be applied all the time as uh, we um, uh, we heard before uh, but um, this uh, asymmetry um, of uh, knowledge and uh, awareness actually can uh, can create a problem so uh, well, not only because uh, actually this uh, um, misleading perception is also present sometime in uh, in the among uh, policymakers and decision makers. Um, so uh, basically, uh, this uh, this lack of uh, insight about what's uh, what's going on at a deeper level can uh, actually um, make. Uh, um, the decision biased, uh, biased and more influenced by uh, by messages or even uh, uh, emotion that can be positive or negative. So it is very important, uh, I think, uh, to address uh, this uh, this gap and to to uh, try to find uh, to identify a way to communicate a complex uh, uh, concept in an easy way that can be accessible to um, to the business community and to to the other I mean uh, uh, other communities. Um, yeah, and uh, especially uh, SMEs, uh, for instance, uh, SMEs uh, represent uh, the um, the vast majority of business uh, in uh, in Europe. Uh, they they are more than ninety nine percent. So, um, with the exception of those uh, SMEs that have uh, uh, like uh, internal uh, competences, uh, uh, the vast majority actually um, um, see AI as uh, like a black box. Um, and they don't understand very well uh, even uh, how uh, this AI uh, can uh, can actually improve uh, uh, their uh, their business. So this is uh, despite uh, uh, there is a lot of uh, talking about uh, AI in the business uh, uh, in the business uh, community, and uh, uh, surely AI has uh, the potential not to increase uh, productivity, reduce cost, uh, and also um, can play. Uh, a key role in uh, in the post pandemic re uh, recovery but uh, um, this is uh, um, this is uh, this can be achieved only if the technology are embedded in the business model and in the organizational model. I found a very interesting uh, this uh, uh, research conducted by MIT Sloan and the um, uh, Boston Consulting Groups. Uh, basically, they found that only 10% of the 3,000 uh, companies that they interview uh, declared that they achieve significant uh, financial benefits uh, out of uh, AI. 
which means uh, they actually increase uh, their revenue uh, by at least uh, 5%. And um, it's also uh, interesting to see that uh, uh, among these uh, 3,000 organizations, uh, uh, more than uh, 60% declare that they are actively working on AI. So uh, we can see uh, the discrepancy between uh, uh, the perception and actually what is uh, the actual uh, benefit. And uh, another interesting aspect that was uh, highlighted uh, in, uh, in this uh, um, study was that these 10% uh, of organizations that achieve significant financial benefits actually um, um, did this because of the uh, strong collaboration between workers and AI and even, uh, even more uh, a mutual learning. Uh, so workers learn from the, the, the system and vice versa. This system were refined and uh, retuned thanks uh, to the uh, worker experience. So I think that uh, uh, this is uh, this kind of a synergy that we need uh, to highlight uh, in, uh, uh, in the business, but also in, uh, in other sectors. Uh, so, um, and also uh, the previous, uh, uh, what I mentioned, uh, highlight the fact that uh, uh, AI is, uh, is not a solution, but it's just uh, a tool. I, I see this uh, as a highway, you know, and uh, uh, mm, again, because uh, clearly as any tool, uh, we need uh, to, to guide uh, to uh, this, uh, uh, this um, instrument. And, uh, but uh, um, during these, uh, uh, these days, actually, we heard a lot of uh, interesting insights you know, about uh, this guardrail. And um, I really think that uh, um, it's important to uh, present this guardrail not as a limitation of research, of innovation or business opportunity, but rather as an enablers. So we need to stress really on the positive side because uh, uh, this guardrail uh, actually allow us uh, to reach the destination in the fastest time possible and with a uh, uh, optimizing the, uh, the resources. And also they, they help us uh, to actually uh, move uh, from um, uh, combine uh, the different dimension of uh, sustainability, environmental, social, and economic. And this is a very important uh, aspect because um, basically we need to make uh, to transform uh, to uh, to move from uh, a, a technological dimension to a multiple dimension that embrace a technology environment social and economic uh, dimension and uh, this is not uh, just a matter of uh, disseminating information or connecting dots but uh, actually requires a deeper uh, transformation, a mindset shift. And how can we um, uh, start, uh, no, uh, implement uh, this, uh, uh, this uh, transformation? I think uh, that uh, we need uh, to do uh, from the beginning, no? Actually, uh, even uh, before the AI design, from the choice, uh, we should start uh, from the choice of, uh, uh, of the problem. Uh, clearly, uh, there are many applications, uh, but uh, we, I think uh, we need uh, to focus on what is uh, uh, relevant and what is, uh, um, I mean, uh, um, we need uh, to focus on the priority you know, for, uh, for the next uh, uh, few uh, decades. And uh, usually the AI design is uh, driven by computer scientists or uh, AI expert that they um, define you know, the algorithm, the models, and also they have to, to actually address many technical issues, so, uh, robustness, safety, um, scalability, modularity, and so on. So, but uh, on top of this, actually we need to, uh, to um, consider other 
aspect, no? the uh, positive and negative uh, impact uh, of, uh, of, this, uh, of the specific uh, solution on the environment, uh, on the user and the community, and uh, on the also the economical uh, impact. So uh, it's important to uh, identify, for instance, uh, possible biases in, uh, in the algorithms or in um, related to the data and um, incomplete data that can uh, trigger actually um, uh, inequalities or uh, they can wide uh, um, uh, social uh, actually social uh, problems so but how can we do this uh, only through an interdisciplinary uh, collaboration because everyone has a partial view no and of course uh, um, this uh, what i'm discussing i mean uh, uh, this uh, introducing this uh, consideration at the design level uh, increase uh, enormously the complexity but uh, and also because we know that um, I mean uh, working in an interdisciplinary way is uh, is not uh, so uh, so straightforward and it takes uh, time you not know, to uh, to get everyone on the same page but uh, this uh, uh, delay let's say let's call like this uh, can actually um, be uh, very useful to for uh, the later phase, you no? Know, to really design something that uh, address effectively the problem, and also um, it can uh, lead uh, to cost saving because uh, many times, uh, actually, because of this uh, lack of uh, interdisciplinarity. Um, um, we we risk uh, to uh, develop uh, uh, wonderful uh, products, uh, wonderful pro uh, solution uh, from the technology viewpoint, but that they don't meet the um, the need of uh, of uh, the user, the the people. Um, so this is, uh, I think, uh, it's important. And uh, in uh, in this uh, uh, consideration, surely we need uh, to uh, include uh, the um, uh, consideration regarding the environmental impact. Uh, we discuss uh, um, in in the previous uh, talk, uh, or we uh, we discuss about uh, the energy consumption, which is important and has to drive also the designer the the, um, the design of the algorithm and the, the model. But uh, this is not uh, the only uh, criteria because uh, uh, other aspects uh, can, uh, can have an environmental impact, uh, water, raw materials, and cycle. And uh, uh, clearly also uh, we need uh, to uh, question about what can be the impact of this uh, solution for, uh, for the user and for the, for the community. Um, also, um, we need uh, to, to figure out uh, if there are uh, um, biases no, in, uh, in the assumption or in the algorithm uh, design. And also, I think uh, we need uh, to pay attention to, to the messages that uh, we convey through the uh, solution, that uh, um, I think uh, it's important uh, to create uh, this uh, uh, sense of uh, collaboration no, between uh, human beings and, uh, and uh, machine. Um, and the economic impact uh, is um, the, this consideration is quite uh, uh, central, no, in uh, business uh, business uh, projects. But um, even in uh, in this uh, in this case, uh, the the design has to be aligned with the business strategy, and also should help uh, leverage the company resource resources no uh, and first of all uh, uh, first of all uh, uh, the human resources but also at a macro uh, consideration for instance uh, uh, in uh, in large uh, project uh, uh, we need to ask uh, if this type of a solution will have a negative impact uh, on uh, on other players uh, stakeholders uh, or uh, if this uh, type of a solution can be adapted and used in other type of uh, 
communities and, uh, for instance, in uh, developing countries. Very often, uh, actually, solutions uh, are designed with, uh, uh, with uh, actually uh, a structure, uh, some assumption from uh, developed countries, no? also because uh, the vast majority of uh, AI experts are from those countries. So just one thing that I forgot to say, um, when I mentioned before the, the social impact, of course, I include all these ethical, ethical consideration. And it's very important to, um, to add these ethical consideration at this stage, not later on, because, um, and also to, to show that this is is not something and add up like a hat, but uh, is part of the solution. And uh, clearly, this is uh, really a complex problem. And how can we achieve this? I think uh, through an active uh, collaboration. And um, but uh, uh, we we talk a lot uh, about uh, collaboration, and uh, there are different uh, levels of uh, collaborating. I think uh, that we need uh, to actually dive deeper, no? And uh, uh, we need uh, to um, uh, to actually learn uh, from each other. So that uh, requires a mindset shift, uh, not to move uh, from one uh, dimension to a multiple uh, dimensional uh, dimension, uh, design, and also to, to move uh, from an approach that is based on competition to another that uh, is based on uh, collaboration. Um, and because uh, also the, the problems that uh, we need to face are really complex. So no one can, uh, can actually provide a, um, a sufficient uh, solution just by looking at one specific uh, uh, angle. Uh, so, and uh, this, uh, um, this uh, um, interaction and dynamic learning you know, from each other and also from, uh, from the machine, from the system, um, will, uh, will help uh, also to, um, uh, to find the ways uh, to communicate uh, these, um, the benefits and also the limitations uh, to, to the wider uh, public and to, con to the consumers as well. So um, EcoSurge, actually, uh, one of the, the pillars of uh, EcoSurge is uh, this uh, cross-sector collaboration. EcoSurge focuses on the design of innovative uh, IoT AI solution for the SDGs uh, by combining uh, uh, um, technology AI with a new business model, for instance, a circular-based model, uh, through an active collaboration across uh, um, research, and uh, SMEs and institutions. And uh, more specifically, we are uh, uh, currently uh, also working on a framework uh, to facilitate uh, the uh, integration of uh, all these uh, aspects uh, from the design. So in, uh, in this uh, conference, I heard the very interesting uh, uh, insights and uh, I welcome uh, collaboration not to, to uh, reach uh, I mean, uh, this, uh, this, uh, this project. And also I want to uh, invite you to a series of a monthly uh, discussion that will uh, uh, we start in September uh, and that will uh, focus on AI for uh, sustainability. So every time I will uh, focus on a specific uh, um, topic uh, and the uh, uh, meeting will uh, consist of a, a 20 minute uh, presentation of an innovative project followed by half an hour discussion. And so I am really happy to hear from you, uh, hear your insight and uh, questions. Thank you. Um, yeah, really, really great to hear from you and, and about what you're doing. I will jump right into the questions. I have a question about um, end cycle. So when you were listing the environmental impacts, you uh, listed end cycle on that slide. Can you tell us more about what end cycle is? So, uh, 
When I, uh, when I mention about uh, end cycle, I, I refer to the fact that uh, um, the infrastructure, no? So uh, AI, uh, actually, uh, we need uh, uh, like a cloud uh, infrastructure. And so we, we need uh, to, to think about the software and, uh, no? and the hardware part. So, and the... Uh, um, and uh, not only, uh, I mean, uh, the, the servers, but uh, also the, uh, the basically um, all the um, accessory, I mean, uh, the, the tools uh, that uh, enable, uh, no, the, uh, for instance, uh, the cooling, uh, cooling infrastructure. So I think uh, that uh, it's, uh, it's uh, very important uh, to actually address uh, also this uh, this problem this is uh, actually part of a, of a project that we are uh, working on so there is not a, a an answer no but uh, yeah. but uh, it is something that uh, we need to take into account i'm saying this uh, because uh, sometimes uh, cloud computing of AI is uh, is perceived as uh, something that is uh, actually ecological because uh, it deals with the uh, software. So we need uh, to actually uh, show what is behind. Okay. And to with it. Yeah, I, I have another question here about um, diversity. So you address the lack of diversity when it comes to the cons of AI design. Can you tell us more about this lack of diversity? Diversity in what sense and how does this relate to sustainability? Yeah, a sustainability uh, encapsulates uh, uh, social, environmental, uh, no, and uh, and uh, economic sustainability, the SDGs. Uh, so uh, clearly, um, I mean, uh, in uh, in that slide, uh, actually, I mentioned just uh, some of the examples, but uh, there are many other uh, aspects uh, not to to analyze. And uh, when I mentioned about uh, lack of uh, diversity. City is because uh, um, I, I mean um, in the design uh, uh, the design uh, basically is made uh, by people <laughs> people that uh, live in a certain uh, context you no know, and that uh, use uh, some assumption so we need uh, to actually make sure that uh, these assumptions are uh, uh, are valid. Of course, uh, when we uh, we work on uh, algorithms, uh, we have to abstract away, no? And we work on abstraction, but we we need to make sure that these abstraction are really uh, reflect the um, the 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 problem, the reality, and also uh, that we are not missing relevant uh, parts, because as I mentioned before, the the work of the uh, designer uh, actually uh, the the algorithms and the model reflect uh, the, the context in which uh, uh, the expert uh, operate. So, and uh, sometimes uh, even uh, if it's, uh, so usually the algorithm is done by uh, IT people, no, uh, computer scientists. And so they, they look at, uh, uh, at uh, technical issues. And uh, they, they, they can, I mean, there is a big risk of missing many other important issues that are uh, beyond uh, the, the technical part. So that are related to who will use uh, this, uh, uh, this, uh, this solution, what is for, and what is the impact? Uh, we can uh, we can think uh, also about uh, the social media, no, and uh, other other um, other uh, uh, innovation that uh, are creating some uh, some problems. I think that this is uh, an example in which uh, uh, probably a more thorough uh, analysis, you know, of the implication would have. Um, led to a better design and uh, would have uh, overcome uh, some problem. So, of course, uh, we cannot, uh, it's difficult or not to, um, to imagine what will be the, uh, the implication. We are not talking about uh, 
uh, I mean, uh, forecasting the future, but just uh, analyzing no? what, uh, what we have now in an interdisciplinary way. So by talking with, uh, with other stakeholders and uh, other experts. Wonderful. So I'd love to keep asking more and more questions, but uh, we are 30 seconds away from our break. So I will uh, end the conversation, but thank you so much for, for your presentation and for being here today, for being here this morning. Looking forward sure. to seeing where it goes. So to the rest of you who are watching on the live stream or joining our Zoom call, we have a 10 minute break now and then we will come back after the break to hear Federica Lucivaro speak to us. And yeah, enjoy your 10 minutes and we'll see you soon.